Buenos dias, America Latina. Good morning, good afternoon world. And welcome to the virtual thematic workshop in mathematical sciences uh, and algebra. This workshop is sponsored by Academia Brasileira de Ciencias and the Facultad de Ciencias Exactas y Naturales from the University of Buenos Aires. It's organized by TUAS, the World Academy of Sciences, and TIAN, TUAS Young Affiliates Network, and the Academia Joven de Argentina. It is my pleasure to introduce first Max Paoli, TUAS Program Coordinator, who will give us uh, some opening words. Born in Trieste, Italy, Max Paoli studied biochemistry at York in the United Kingdom and obtained a PhD in chemistry focusing on protein structure. He worked in research projects at the Harvard Medical School in New Zealand, and sorry, and in New Zealand, before becoming a David Phillips Research Fellow in Cambridge in the United Kingdom, where he also began to teach. He held lectureship positions in Australia and Nottingham. And since starting to work for the World Academy of Sciences, Max widened his interest for education and sustainable development. Welcome, Max. Please, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I should say, uh, buenas dias, followed by amigos, just to make this introduction less formal and uh, more friendly since I think the overarching theme is one of interaction and collaboration and hopefully more. I believe that so far uh, the young affiliates have shown also a sign of incredible uh, friendship in the way they've interacted in a very close way. Um, I, I didn't know whether to start with a negative note or a positive note, because <laughs> we are talking to each other from far away. Uh, this time we're not shaking hands uh, as we've done uh, uh, in the past. This could be seen as a negative note, but it's actually a positive note too, because we are actually still seeing each other and we're still talking to each other. So we should be grateful that COVID did not take place uh, 10 or 15 years ago, because then uh, I think it would have been much more difficult to keep in touch and to keep doing what, we are, what you're doing. And what you're doing now, what you're about to start is, is absolutely uh, fantastic and incredible. I, I'd like to endorse it on behalf of the World Academy of Sciences and, and uh, also from my heart personally, as much as, pos as I possibly can. You know that, needless to say, that COVID has uh, paralyzed a lot of interactions and, and forced us into a, a mode of working in this way kind of remotely. And uh, I think uh, this is why it's so incredibly useful that um, you are organizing uh, events or workshops such as this one, because it, it is imperative to keep talking to each other and to keep trying to work together. Um, there is an expression I, I really like, I, I kind of became familiar with it, strangely, only after I started working for TWAS, even though before I still valued collaborations a lot. But after working for TWAS, I heard this expression that stuck to me. Collaboration brings innovation. As I said, even before, I believed very much in collaboration, but I think it was more under the umbrella of interdisciplinarity, because many of the problems that we look at and we tackle are highly complex in nature, and therefore require the input of different sciences coming together. However, I think the reason why this expression stuck to me to us is because of the word innovation. I think perhaps before I wasn't as um, sensitive to that particular aspect of science and technology, 
I think uh, we should be definitely uh, sensitive to it now. Uh, as I said, we are uh, communicating thanks to digital platforms, which are a result of the innovation. My last point is this, that I believe most uh, of the people that are, are talking to each other today are, are young. I, I wish I could join you in that, but uh, never mind. Uh, I think uh, I'll pass because I'm not so young anymore. But what I mean is that we should really, really support the work of young people. I think to us is, is committed, I hope uh, it is true to say that to us is really committed to keep supporting the young affiliates and actually increasing uh, their role, um, giving them a stronger, uh, more important role. Therefore, um, I, I, all, all is left for me to say is to, to say thank you to the organizers. I'm ever so grateful for the incredible support and collaboration of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences, uh, Professor Davidovic, um, Kenya, and many others. I'm also very grateful to Franco, many other young affiliates. Uh, their input is, is so highly commendable. I really hope you keep up the effort. Um, I, I also thank the um, Academy in Argentina and, uh, and, and, and above all, the speakers. Without the speakers uh, who have prepared their presentations and will be uh, sharing them today, you, you wouldn't have such a, a nice um, uh, gathering of, of, of scientists that hopefully will be inspired. So keep up the inspiration and have a very good meeting. Thank you very much, Max, for these warm and inspiring words. So this being said, um, it is my pleasure to introduce the first speaker of today. So let me introduce Alicia Dickenstein. Alicia Dickenstein is a professor at the University of Buenos Aires and Investigadora Superior at the National Research Council of Argentina. She is a member of the National Academy of Exact and Natural Sciences and of the National Academy of Sciences of Argentina. She was president, sorry, she was vice, vice president of the International Mathematical Union and a member of the Council of the American Mathematical Society. She received the 2015 TWASP Prize in Mathematics. She is also an IMS Fellow and a SIAM Fellow. She holds an honorary doctorate from Universidad Nacional del Sur in Argentina and the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. And today she will present a talk on optimal Descartes rules of science for polynomial system support on circuits. Welcome, Alicia. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I am also very happy to be in this activity organized by young people. I'm not young any longer, so thank you very much for this uh, invitation. And I share the words by Max Paoli. So, okay, I will, um, I will try to speak about something which is, I think the problem is very easy to be understood. And I would like to show you that even with this easy question, the answer is not so easy. So let me share my screen. Is it okay? Good. Okay, so this is the title, Optimal Descartes Rule of Science for Polynomial System Support and Circuits, and I will explain all these words. So this is the plan of my lecture. I will start uh, telling you about the univariate case. Then I will explain which is our setting. And then I will try to introduce which, what is known about a multivariate version of this Descartes rule of science, and then I will end. Okay, so the univariate case goes back to the 17th century. It was proposed by René Descartes in, a, in an appendix to his <clears throat> 
philosophy book on discourse de la méthode. And it's, he didn't prove the result, but he stated it. And the result is the following. So we have a polynomial in one real variable. Here, x is our variable, and c is the coefficients of our polynomial f. So we see 0 plus c1x blah, blah, plus crx to the r. And then the, the Descartes rule says that the number of positive real roots of our polynomial is bounded above by the number of sign variations of the order sequence of coefficient signs. What does it mean? We take the signs of all the coefficients of the sign of a number is one if it is positive, minus one if it is negative, and zero if it is zero, okay? Then the sign variation is the following. We forget about the zeros, and each time there is a jump from plus to minus or minus to plus, or one to minus one or minus one to one. So we, we add one to the sign variation. For, for instance, if our polynomial is like this, then we have plus, plus, and this is minus. So here there is one sign variation, and here there is another one. And this here, it depends on the sign of C0. So even if the degree is 111, but it could be any number here bigger than eight, the sequence of coefficients signs, discarding the zeros is the sign of this, plus, minus, plus, plus. So the variation equals, sorry, two, if C0 is non-negative and three if it is negative. So F has at most two or three positive real roots. This is in contrast from in con contrast for the number of complex roots, which is 111. So this is the same that I said. Moreover, the, the, the sign variation and the number of positive roots have the same parity. For instance, if F has a minus one as constant term, then the sign variation is three. So this means that F has either three or one positive real roots. And one consequence of this is that we can bound the, the, the number of positive roots in terms of the non-zero terms independently of the degree of F, right? Okay, so this is a very simple and something which is not written here because I cut several slides is that this rule is sharp, sharp in the sense that it is attained, okay? For instance, if a polynomial has all real roots, all the roots of the polynomial are real, then this is an equality. The number of positive roots equals the sign variation. So this is the meaning of sharp, okay? You cannot improve it in general. So what is, so we would like to generalize it to several variables. So this is our setting. So here, we, the, we are dealing with what is called a sparse system. A sparse system of polynomials means that we set, we fix the exponent set. So we take monomials x to the a with a in this finite set. Here we are not only taking non-negative exponents, but they also allow uh, negative integers as exponents, okay? So these polynomials are called Laurent polynomials. So we fix the exponent set and we consider the family of polynomials with these exponents. So these are, this is the coefficient of the polynomial CI with respect to the monomial X to the A. And then we are going to take N monomial, N polynomials in N variables because we would like to expect a finite number of solutions. And then the information is given by this uh, finite set A that we are going to accommodate in a matrix in, in a minute. And when the matrix of coefficients, so this C is a matrix, the size is there are N rows and the number of columns equals the cardinality of A, okay? And so it is well known that if we look for the number of isolated common roots in the complex torus, so instead of non-zero real numbers as at the x as we allow non-zero complex numbers. Then there is this a beautiful bound proved by Gelf and Capra, sorry, by <laughs> uh, Bernstein, Kuznirenko, and Hovansky, which is the, what's called the normalized volume of the convex hull of A, which is essential. You, you, you have the exponent set A, you take the convex hull, and you multiply the Euclidean volume by n factorial so that you get an integer. 
And this is a sharp bound for the number of complex roots in the torus. In particular, this bounds the number of positive roots. And this is sharp because it is an equality for generic coefficients. Okay. And then just having this idea that the, 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 we can bound the number of positive solutions in terms of the number of non-zero terms. Then there was a breakthrough proved by Hovansky. This is in a book in 91. He proved that the number, the maximal number of non-degenerate real solutions, non-degenerate non -degenerate means that the Jacobian does not vanish at any common root, is bounded above in terms of the cardinality of A by this number, which is fantastic because there is a number, but this is very, very non-sharp. Okay. And there are very few particular sharp bounds. This bound has not really been improved. There are very, very few cases where we have a precise bound. And all these bounds in this situation take into account A, but not the particular matrix C. And we want to take into account both things, right? And so in principle, deciding the number of uh, real or positive roots is a question of quantifier elimination, okay? And then it is known to be effectively computable by result of Tarski and also Collins uh, decide an algorithm to do this. It's called um, cylindric algebraic decomposition. But then working with parametric coefficients as well, while working on this family of, of polynomials, it has too many branchings, branchings and it is unfeasible. Okay? And we would like to have a more structural result. So our setting is this. We have uh, n sparse polynomials in n variables as before. We're going to call Na of C, the number of positive roots of the system. And we know that when it is finite, it is at most the normalized volume of A, but it could be much smaller. So and our problem is bound the number of positive roots of the system. And we would like to have a sign variation of a sequence associated to A and C that we need to determine in, a, in the spirit of the card rule of signs. Which is so simple, right? Sorry, my voice is not working well. So this is just a simple example to explain the notation. So here A is this finite set I'm drawing. This is 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 1, et cetera. These black dots are our configuration. This is the convex hull. The normalized volume is twice. The Euclidean volume is 8. So the number of complex roots in the torus is 8. So this is the matrix of coefficients. This means that we are going to take as constant terms one for the first polynomial minus two for the second one. And for instance, this, the, the, the coefficient of x, y square is going to be a minus one and a minus one. So this is our system. So we can write our system this way. We take the matrix of coefficients times a column vector, which is the vector of monomials, okay? So, something that we observe that these vectors of monomials is in the kernel of this matrix. And we'll write it down in a second. A necessary condition for the existence of at least one positive root is that the, this real matrix admits a positive vector in the kernel. Okay, This is the, the obvious uh, necessary condition. So in this case, with this coefficient, this uh, red curve is F1, the blue curve is F2. And despite the fact that there, there could be uh, eight complex roots, there are only in the torus, there are exactly two positive solutions. It's much smaller, okay? And here is a comment about the gen degenerations, but we won't uh, speak about this in this moment. Okay, so what are the known results about the multivariate cut rule? So first, there was a first partial generalization that I um, obtained in this paper that I call the paper of the thousand authors. We are not a thousand, but we are quite a few. Uh, we were in Dachstuhl, which is like um, over Wolfach for mathematicians, but for computer science. And we realized we were working on applications to biochemical reaction networks. And we realized that we were all using signs in determining uh, monostationarity. And then we try to abstract what we 
we're seeing, and we got a result that uh, asserts when there is at most a single positive root that I'm not going to talk about this at this moment. But then I realized that this was a, a way of generalizing the, the card rule that I, I had known since young. And then we started working and okay, but this is the, the on a case only when there is at most, when can we assert that there is at most one positive root, but how can we get uh, bounds in general? And the only <laughs> result that we have are in the case of what is called a circuit. So essentially a circuit means that we're going to have n plus two monomials in n variables, that the cardinality of our support set is going to be n plus two in n variables, okay? Circuit means a little bit more, I will explain in a second. And then uh, I had a first paper in 2017, and then we have a new paper with uh, Frédéric Bian, uh, he's from uh, Chambéry and Jens Forsgaard. And uh, this has been posted in archive uh, last month. And I'm going, this is what I'm going to explain to you. Hmm? But the full gen multivariate generalization is wide open. So I think this is interesting because this, it's a very easy to understand open problem. Okay, so our setting is <clears throat> that we have the exponents. I'm going to call the, I'm going to enumerate my subset A and I have n plus two points, but I'm going to number them from zero to n plus one. And we can assemble them in a matrix of size n times n plus two. And we also have the matrix of coefficients, which is a real matrix of signs n times n plus two. And we are going to assume that this matrix has rank n. If we don't have n linearly independent equations, then we expect an infinite number of solutions, right? Okay. <clears throat> so we want to ob obtain a bound for the number of positive uh, solutions. And the first observation is this is an affine invariant of A. So we can produce a, a change of coordinates, a monomial change of coordinates in the torus, or we can shift the configuration and the number of positive roots is not going to change. So this, this should depend on the minors of the following matrix. So we have our matrix A and we add a row of ones. Why? Because this way, the kernel of this matrix will have the, real, the, the elements of the kernel of A, but those which add up to zero, these are the affine relations among our points. So we have the first coordinate of one. So now we have a matrix which is of size n plus one times n plus two. And then our, the bound should depend on the maximal minors of this matrix. And we, will assume without loss of generality, in fact, that the convex hull of A has dimension N. Hmm? Or this, again, that the, the, the dimension of the convex hull of A equals the true number of variables on which our system is depending on. I cannot explain it more, but this is, a, this is a true number of variables. So we assume that the true number of variables is N because we expect to have final number of solutions again. Or we don't want to have an overdetermined system with which in general we know won't have solutions, right? And then this assumption means assuming that this matrix has full rank n plus one. Then we have a matrix of full rank and it has one more column than rows. And then it is well known as a basic result in linear algebra, how to find a generator of the kernel of this matrix over the ra rationals at least. And then is generated by a vector which is given by the alternating minors of this matrix. So we take the first column out, we have a square matrix, we take the determinant, then we take the second column out all the way, and we take the alternating signs of the determinants of the matrix where we skip one of the columns, and these give us a generator of the kernel. In fact, it's a basis over Q of the kernel. But then there are further invariances. So in fact, we can multiply each equation by a different monomial and we won't change the number of positive roots. And then in fact, if one thinks of this a little, little more, one understands that 
In fact, our answer should be in terms invariant by the minors of this matrix, which is called the Cayley matrix. What's the Cayley matrix? So we add n rows, so, so A prime is the matrix with columns A0. So we, sorry, we call it um, A before, but I'm sorry for the change of notation. So here we put the matrix with column A0, AM plus one. And then we add ones, how many are ones? N plus two ones, one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one. So now this matrix we had N, we added N rows. So it is a two N times and the number of columns is N times N plus two, okay? Then it happens that the number we're looking for is invariant under left multiplication of this matrix by an invertible matrix. So our bound should depend on the Plucker coordinates of this matrix, which is on the maximal minus of this Cayley matrix. But if you do a, La a Laplace expansion of this matrix starting with the upper n rows, we see that all maximal minors of A occur as minors of this matrix. And also any minor is a linear combination of minors of A with coefficients 0, 1, and minus 1. OK, we can assume without uh, loss of generality that A is a circuit. Circuit means that the, the A is mi minimally affinely dependent, which means that all lambda j's here is dif are different from 0. So this means that no three of them lie on a line, OK? That any three of them are affinely independent. This is the meaning of this condition. So if we assume this in. In the plane, there are two possible uh, combinatorial configurations that are in, in the different combinatorially. One is either the, we have n plus two equals four, either the four points are the vertices of the convex hull, or one point is inside the convex hull of the others. And we, sorry, if we move this point out, if we, here this means that this point is a positive combination of this. So if you look at the vector in the kernel, it will have one positive entry and three negative ones. And here it will have two positive and two negatives. And if we start moving, when we get here, there will not, it will not be a circuit. And when we move, the signs of the minors will change. Okay. So here it says there are two combinatorial types of circuits. And in this case, our result will prove that there cannot be more than two positive roots. In this case, there could be three, and this three is uh, n plus one. But what is interesting that this is true for any n. So for any n, if our n plus two points are this way, we have n plus one points that are the vertices of a simplex, and the other point is inside. This prevents the configuration for ha to have many positive roots. In half, the number of positive roots can be at most two. For any n, it, it is at most two. Okay, so the combinatorial position of the exponents bounds the number of positive roots. So how do we get our result? We need to pass what is called the Gale dual system, Gale dual setting. So we start with, so as I said, a necessary condition is that we have a positive vector in the kernel. This means that the vector zero is a positive, so you have a positive vector in the kernel, you have matrix C times this positive vector equal to zero. So zero is a positive combination of the columns of C. So the first condition is that zero needs to lie in the positive cone generated by the columns of the matrix. But we can translate this into what's called the Gale dual setting. So given our full rat matrix C, we take a matrix D whose columns generate the kernel of C. We get this matrix, and then we take the row vectors of this matrix. Okay. These vectors form what's called the Gale dual configuration to the configuration of columns of a matrix. And it's easy to see that zero lies in the positive cone generated by the columns if and only if these row vectors lie in an open half space through the origin, okay? There should be a vector which has positive inner product with all of them. So our vectors PI, they come from the rows 
of any matrix whose columns generate the kernel of C. So for instance, this could be our configuration here, n equals six, so there are eight vectors, and we have P0, P1, P2, etc. So our result will imply that as they lie on only four rays, then the number of positive solutions could be at most three. So if there are four rays, then there could be at most three positive solutions. What we're going to do is the following. So as we're in the plane, is they lie on a open house space, we can order the rays. And then we are going to <clears throat> number the rays 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay. And then I'm going to tell you the theorem. Okay, this is the theorem. So we assume that our matrix A bar, which is we enhance the matrix with the first uh, row of ones, as rank n plus one, the matrix of coefficients as rank n, zero lies in this positive cone. And we assume that there are k plus one number of different lines containing the PIs. And then what we took is a, a numbering of these lines in counterclockwise order or in the other direction, but we use this orientation to number the lines. Okay, so we have this. This is given, so I didn't say, it, but this is interesting. The fact that there are PIs which are linearly dependent is a manifest manifestation of the fact that there are zero minors in C. So if our matrix C is what's called uniform, if all minors in C are non-zero, then all the PIs would be linearly independent. So this will mean that if our matrix has zero minors, then the number of positive roots has to decay. There has to be less positive roots. So we have these lines. And if there are, if this number is less than n plus two, is because there are zero minors. And then what we're going to, to do is the follow. So this lambda j is remember the minors of the matrix a bar, a bar, which comes from A. So we are going to sum all the minors in each of the rows. So we have k plus one rows for each of the rows that comes from the dependencies of C, we are going to add the minors, the, the, the sign minors of A, of A bar. And then we, are, we need to consider further sums. We are going to take the first one, then the first plus the second, the first plus the second plus the third, et cetera, all the way. If we add them all, we're going to get zero because of the, our matrix A bar had the first row of ones. So we take, these sums of minors of A and these further sums of minors of A that comes from the orientation given by the signs of the minors of C. And then the result is that the number of positive roots is at most one plus the sign variation of this sequence given by the muse. And the difference is an even integer and the bound is sharp for any A. So what are these muse? Okay. Well, this muse comes from the following. So, and, and this, uh, it, it is not said, but this bound is sharp. This means that they're always given any A, there are um, systems of matrix C for which this is an equality. So we cannot improve it in general. So this is sharp upper bound. And the sharpness comes from what something that I cannot explain now, but it's called combinatorial patchworking and a uh, Viro. Peter is a Russian mathematician, and it uses what is called regular mixed subdivision of the Minkowski sum. The Minkowski sum are all sums of taking one element, one element here, plus one here, plus one here. So sums of n elements in A. So for instance, if A is this, so a is 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, but this should be at the origin. This is not at the origin, but this is the shape of A. Here, what you see is this black dots correspond to A plus A. So A plus A, instead of having size 1, 1, and 2, has size 2, 2, and 4. So this is A plus A. And what you are here, A is uh, the unit square. Hmm? 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0, this unit square, twice is the two square. 
And here A is 00300311. Wow. So here it is. You cannot see it, but it is this triangle at the origin with this inner point. Okay. And what you're seeing here is what are called um, regular mix subdivision. It comes from a lifting and a projection, and you get this subdivision. And what happens is, is that somehow you get, you recover A, so this plus this equals the area of A here, here, and same here, twice, because we are taking A plus A. But then there are these, what are called the mixed cells that come from an edge from one copy and an edge from the second copy. Here there are, there are these parallelograms are the mixed cells. Here you see three, two, and three. And then, then if there are two, this is a certificate that there cannot be more than two positive roots. Here there could be up to three, but they need to be deco positively decorated by the matrix. And in fact, in this case, you can have three. And in this case, you cannot have more than, there is an obstruction with the signs because you are turning around. Hmm? This is the configuration that I told you that you cannot have more than two. So I, I cannot uh, explain more now, but it's very beautiful. It's, uh, it mixes the signs with the combinatorics and gives an algebraic result on the number of positive roots. So there are many open questions. The first one is that, we cannot, our methods do not extend to when we have already n plus three points. It is, and this small example shows you the intricacy of the general case. And we need new ideas even to state a conjectural multivariate route. So we don't have how to, it's not that we know, don't know how to prove the conjecture. There's no conjecture. So a lot of work has to be done to find the conjecture. For instance, we don't know how to order the minors in general and we don't know. So what is a degeneration is just very naively. It means that one of the coefficients is much bigger than the, or much bigger or much smaller than the other. Certain, in fact, certain monomials in the coefficients is much bigger than, than, the, than the others. So we go somehow in, in coefficient space, we are going close to infinity, but we are, we, there's no result how to bound the number of positive roots out, outside infinity. Okay, so they are not accessible. I'm calling them via the generations. So I hope you like the program and I hope you get a new result on this. And just before ending, I thank you for your annotation and a little bit of propaganda. If you have a fantastic paper using tools from algebra, geometry, topology, which is related to applications, please submit to this new science journal on applied algebra and geometry. And if you have a good, not your best paper, but a good paper, uh, we will be very happy to receive it in Revista de la Unión Matemática Argentina. It's the journal of the Argentina Mathematical Union. It's completely free for complete open access, completely free for authors and readers. And it uh, has a tradition now. Our impact factor is 0, 0 0.5 to 2, which is not so bad for a math journal. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alicia, for this wonderful talk. Um, let me remind first the audience, uh, since I have seen now that many people are joining from different parts of the world, that we will have at the end of this workshop a Q&A session. So please pre prepare your questions for the last parts of the workshop. You can send them uh, either through the chat or when the Q&A session begins, you can just ask your question. This being said, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the next speaker. The next speaker is Pavel uh, Saleski. So um, Pavel Saleski uh, did his PhD at the Academy of Sciences of Belarus, and he is currently a full professor at the Department of Mathematics at the University of Brasilia. Uh, he is a member of the uh, Brazilian Academy of Sciences, and his interests are focused in non-commutative groups, especially prop groups, prof, uh, profinite trees, residual finite groups. He has supervised uh, several PhD students and postdocs, 
and published more than 90 papers in many prestigious journals, such as the Publication Mathematique de l'IHS, Duke, Trails Journal, Advances, Geometry and Topology, and so on. And today, uh, Professor Saleski is going to talk about uh, finite quotients of three manifold groups. This being said, uh, the microphone is yours. I think we cannot hear you now. So, right. You are muted. You're muted, I think. I'm trying to unmute myself. Now you're okay. unmuted. I can. Okay. All right. One, wonderful. A second thing. Uh, uh, a share screen does work well. Can you see it here? Uh, can you I... see it? We can see it, but I think it will be better if you put the whole the screen. full screen. Yes. Okay. Right there. Wonderful. Okay. Okay. So, so first I want to thank uh, the organizers of this uh, event to uh, to invite me here. All right. It's my pleasure to be here with you. And uh, yes, I'm uh, talking about a uh, final question of three manifold groups, and I want to start with the following observation that, uh, in fact, it was always one of the mainstream of mathematics to find invariance of geometric objects and to uh, try to determine to what extent this uh, geometric, uh, this invariance can uh, uh, define, actually determine geometric objects. And that's why uh, how algebraic topology, for example, started, right? The, indeed, the objective of algebraic topology is to find uh, algebraic invariance of geometric objects and to determine to what extent, uh, to find out to what extent uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the invariance, uh, algebraic invariance uh, to determine uh, the geometric object itself, right? And what is the uh, main geometric object one more famous? It's a manifold, right? And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the most known uh, first invariant, uh, algebraic invariant of uh, topological of manifold is a fundamental group. Uh, however, fundamental group is uh, infinite usually. And from heuristic point of view, uh, it is good to have a finite invariance. So that's why. I will start with the following uh, question that has uh, sense of this explanation. To what extent are finite quotients of the fundamental group of a manifold M determine the structure of the manifold? All right. Well, uh, uh, just thinking about this question, right? One can uh, should ask first question. Uh, to what extent fundamental group itself determines the manifold, of course. And uh, for three manifolds, uh, the answer is uh, almost yes, practically. Right? So, I mean, only uh, exception is uh, length spaces. And I'm not going to say what is length spaces because uh, the fundamental group of a length space is quite simple. It is just finite cyclic group. And therefore, uh, the question that I'm considering now doesn't have sense for these spaces uh, anyhow. All right. Uh, in all other cases, fundamental group uh, determines three manifold. And therefore, uh, our question reduced to the question to what extent finite quotients of the fundamental group determine uh, the fundamental group itself. All right. Okay. Uh, and uh, well, fundamental group is a group, all right? And uh, therefore we can put it in general form. Uh, to what extent uh, G, uh, a group G is determined by its finite quotient? And it is all question in group theory, right? But first we have to uh, sort of uh, to reduce ourselves because if we take a general question, uh, just for any group and to ask this question, then we uh, see that, uh, for example, infinite simple group, right? Or uh, doesn't have uh, quotients at, at all. 
or for example, the group of rational numbers doesn't have finite quotients on top. And therefore uh, this question, right, has sort of a negative answer because we cannot distinguish group by, uh, uh, by its finite quotient with trivial group, right? So uh, we need uh, to restrict our class to groups that somehow uh, can be approximated by their finite quotients. And this class is called residually, uh, the, the, uh, is called the class of residually finite groups, right? And uh, well, uh, so uh, the definition of, of a group uh, uh, is uh, group G is residually finite, the group G is residually finite. If uh, for any element, non-trivial element G, there exists a finite quotient such that uh, the image of uh, our little G in this finite quotient is non-trivial, right? So in some sense, yes, we can, uh, uh, for residually finite group, we can view as the group that can be approximated by finite portions, right? And it is equivalent to the uh, to the fact that intersection of all normal subgroups of finite index is trivial. Right? So G is residually finite if uh, intersection of all normal subgroups of finite index is trivial. Right? Now. Uh, of course, if given a group, right, we can just take intersection of all normal subgroups of finite index, and we uh, will uh, this intersection will be a subgroup that is not visible by finite quotients itself. Right? Then factor out this uh, normal subgroup one come to residually finite group uh, exactly where we have to be. Right? Now, I uh, uh, so the question uh, have to be stated within residually finite group naturally, right? And it was investigated since the 60s of the last century by Baumslag, Remesnik, Siegel, Grunewald, all right? And I just give one simple sample of the result we want to obtain and one open question, which are open since then. Uh, first, um, uh, the sample is the following. If we have polycyclic bifinite group, it is determined by its finite quotient up to finitely many isomorphism graphs, right? Up to finitely many of them, right? Polycyclic group is the group which is uh, built by extension by cyclic groups. Cyclic, extended by cyclic, extended by cyclic, extended by cyclic, extended by cyclic, and then and we can uh, do uh, even uh, extension by five. Right? And there is one open question that uh, opens since uh, uh, 1974, right? Whether, uh, uh, whether free group, finitely generated free group, right, is uh, determined by its finite quotient. Right? Uh, this is uh, uh, open and uh, uh, still uh, there is not too much approach of this. Also, some groups uh, uh, were detected uh, recently, like triangle groups, have a property that they are determined by fine quotient. But this is uh, the major question of uh, this uh, stream of investigation. This is about group theory. And I started with manifolds, so I want to uh, come back to uh, manifold, all right? But first, I want to, uh, I want to, uh, describe what is the approach to the problem. So uh, we have two groups, for example, right? And uh, residually finite, right? And we have many finite quotients of them. So we have two infinite families and we have to compare them somehow. So how can we, how can we compare these two families? They're infinite. The approach of this is the following. Uh, we take all finite quotients of the object of a group, right? And they, uh, form an inverse limit and we take inverse limit of them. Then we come to the group which is called profinite. And profinite groups has a long history also in mathematics because they were studied extensively because profinite groups are exactly groups which are Galois groups of infinite Galois extensions. So they were studied because of the algebraic number theory, because of the Galois theory, right? Plus, all right, 
it is nice topological object because it is group a topological group which is compact uh, and house door and totally disconnect all right so from this point of view they uh, were started considerably right they have a nice topological property so one can hope that uh, this object right will uh, help us to uh, to understand the original group and i just give one example of the profinite completion of the integers is just direct product all right of all uh periodic integers right uh, by all p right. what is uh advantage of this all right the advantage of this is the following is the following probability proposition that finitely generated group have the uh, uh, groups have two finitely generated groups have the same families of fine portions if and only if the profile completions are isomorphic. So we reduced our problem, right? Not to compare infinite families, but to compare two infinite objects with one property, uh, with nice properties. Namely, we come uh, to the isomorphism problem, right? Uh, of groups, right? Where we have isomorphisms of the profile completion, right? And therefore, our original question, right, can for group can be uh, reformulated the following way: To what extent does uh, profinite completion determine the group itself? So, if we come to the manifold, right, our question is: To what extent the profinite completion of the uh, fundamental group of the manifold determine the manifold itself, right? And the uh, important fact in this thing, right, is uh, that all three manifold groups are reasonably fine. So they come uh, really into the uh, our class of group. Okay, so let's come to three manifolds, right? But we start actually with comparing them with two manifolds. What in two manifolds known? Well, in two manifolds known the uniformization theorem that says the following that a two-dimensional manifold that is surface, right? It is either Riemann surface, it is a Riemann surface that uh, admits one of the three geometries. Either it is Euclidean or spherical, which is sphere, or hyperbolic. There are three geometries. So the every uh, Riemann surface uh, is through this type. All right. And Unfortunately, in three-dimensional manifolds, it is far from being the case. Instead, all right, uh, there is a geometrization conjecture that proved by Perelman, uh, by Perelman, right? Namely, that every closed three-manifold can be decomposed in a canonical way. This canonical way is, uh, is called GSJ, the cancel position, in pieces by cutting along the toruses, all right? And each piece have one of the eight uh, type of uh, geometric structures. It is called uh, some called geometrization uh, Thurston conjecture, right? And uh, the each piece, uh, right, admits one of the the following eight geometries. This is a list of eight geometries. I ordered them by increase of the fundamental group. So first geometry is spherical geometry, all right? It is uh, uh, right. It is spherical geometry. This is when fundamental group is finite, right? Now I uh, there is come uh, come with the word virtually. What means virtually? All right. Virt uh, the group is called virtually a certain property if there is a subgroup of finite index of it having this property. So, for example, finite group is virtually trivial. All right. Uh, virtually cyclic group means that uh, that the group has a cyclic subgroup of finite index, and so on. so spherical geometry is uh, has finite fundamental group. Then the geometry of S two times R, where S is uh, is a two-dimensional sphere, right? Is fun uh, it is the geometry where fundamental group is virtually cyclic but not finite. So this infinite group which is virtually cyclic. Uh, then Euclidean geometry, it is uh, a geometry where fundamental group is virtually uh, abelian, but not virtually cyclic. All right, Euclidean geometry, it is, I mean, the model is E3, uh, our Euclidean space. Nil geometry, 
All right, it is uh, when fundamental group is virtually important, but not virtually abelian. Soul geometry, it is when fundamental group is virtually soluble, but not virtually important. And then there are three geometries which are big, namely the six and seven, it is uh, so called si uh, surface manifolds. Uh, it is where fundamental group is virtually a direct product in the first case, uh, case in, in the case six of a, a group of integers and fundamental group of a Riemann surface. The seventh case, it is when it is extension, right? Right, of uh, mean that uh, it contains a normal subgroup which is isomorphic to integers and the quotient of it is a, 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 is a fundamental group of a surface but it doesn't split as a direct product. And the last geometry is hyperbolic geometry which is most difficult right and most interesting one right it is when fundamental group doesn't contain direct product of uh, uh, z cross z right and then the natural question okay can our fundamental group can our uh, profinite completion of the fundamental group or can finite quotients of fundamental group detect the geometry of the manifold this is a question that uh, I'm addressing in the talk, right? And uh, the question, how to approach this question, right? All right, the question is natural. We want to detect geometry by considering finite quotients of fundamental group. Well, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, 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 the, the fact that fundament of the uh, three manifold, right? It decomposes nicely in this, right? Or meaning geometrization conjecture was proved by uh, Perelman that implied in turn uh, solution of approving the Poincare conjecture, famous Poincare conjecture. All right. And uh, it can be resumed, uh, right, in, in three conjectures, right? All right. The first one, elliptization conjecture, that one with the actually implied the Poincare conjecture, right? Saying that closed manifold is spherical if and only if fundamental group is fine. Then Soviet conjecture that uh, proved by something but else that fundamental group is infinite. Uh, then uh, manifold is cyclic fiber if and only if it has an infinite cyclic normal subgroup. And hyperbolization theorem, right? Uh, 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 that proved by Thurston itself, right? That uh, says that M is hyperbolic if and on if fundamental group does not contain direct product of uh, two uh, groups, uh, infinite cyclic groups, Z cross Z, right? So to approach the question, first thing to do uh, is to prove, is to prove somehow profinite version of this uh, set conjecture, right? And uh, this, uh, three conjectures, and that's that what uh, was done uh, by uh, me. So, what is the profinite version of this? All right, and Henry Wilton, but uh, I tell you, what is the profinite version of geometric conjecture? We need just to complete it. But the first problem, right, it stays identical. Why? Because fundamental group is finite in this case, and therefore, profinite completion of this, right, is just the same group. All right. And in uh, conjecture uh, two and three, we just need to put a hat above uh, everything, right? Because we need to talk about profinite completion, All right? So that's what we needed to prove. Actually, the profinite version of the conjecture two is for profinite version of hyper, uh, hyperbolization theory, all right? And uh, that's the, the first result I want to present. It was proved by Henry Wilton and the speaker, all right? Uh, that indeed, and, and hyperbolization theorem, right? And Sophie conjecture, right? Uh, indeed hold uh, in the profinite world, all right? Namely that profinite completion, or it is the same as finite quotients of fundamental uh, uh, group, determine whether a uh, group, uh, the, whether manifold is hyperbolic, right? Or uh, manifold is surface fiber, uh, fiber, surface fiber, right? Now, uh, 
Oops. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, well, we can come back uh, to this, all right, and see uh, how do we uh, do them, all right? So we have this uh, geometries, and they uh, uh, they actually was uh, uh, ordered by uh, fundamental group, and one can see that actually we have to work only for the case six, seven, and eight. Right. Because uh, uh, the geometries one to six already determined clearly by uh, the profinite completion, completion of the fundamental group, because the property mentioned here, like soluble but not virtually nilpotent, uh, virtually nilpotent but not virtually abelian, they all preserved in the profinite completion, and therefore uh, uh, it is clear how to distinguish, uh, clearly they distinguish geometry from one from the other, right? And uh, this uh, profinite version of Sofit conjecture and, uh, uh, and certain conjecture of hyperbolization theorem, they actually distinguish uh, geometry six, seven, and eight uh, from each other. Okay, so we can do uh, geometries, right? distinguish geometries from that, and then comes to the question. Okay, so we have three manifold. All right, and then it can be uh, decomposed into uh, connected sum, all right, into irreducible manifold. And then uh, irreducible manifold by cutting along the toruses, all right, can be uh, uh, cut into pieces, uh, such that every, each piece uh, admits one of these eight geometries, right? The question is uh, then, next question, whether uh, finite quotients of fundamental group the de detect actually the way we cut this into the pieces, right? And this is the next uh, question, and this is the next question uh, that uh, was addressed, all right? And after I state on the theorem that indeed, all right, profinite completion, all right, determines right, the geometry of the uh, irreducible three manifold, right? We come to the question uh, that first, all right, uh, the finite quotients of the, the fundamental group uh, actually uh, reduce the question to reducible three manifolds. This one, uh, that one that do not uh, decompose into the connected sum, plus, all right, uh, that indeed uh, the way we cut a manifold, namely JSJ decomposition of the manifold, right, is detected by the profinite completion of the fundamental total group and uh, therefore by finite quotients of the fundamental group. This is uh, uh, why it is important, because these two theorems actually reduce the question, reduce the question to det uh, of determining manifold to those manifolds that have uh, geometry. So to exactly those pieces into which we can cut manifold. So now the question is whether we can determine manifold having geometry already, one of the A geometry, by finite quotients of the fundamental group. Okay, so uh, let's come back to the geometries and ask this question. Now, as I said, the first geometry, right? It is trivial because uh, fundamental group is finite, so there is no question. Right? Now, what we have is uh, that in second geometry, it is small geometry, right? Second geometry is two. This is detected completely by fundamental uh, by finite quotients of the fundamental group. Euclidean geometry, in case of Euclidean geometry, also. This geometry, uh, the, the manifold with this geometry also is detected uh, by finite quotients of the fundamental group. Also, this is true uh, for new geometry. And this is uh, more or less easy results. The first uh, case when, uh, fundament, uh, when uh, fundament, fi finite quotients of fundamental group doesn't detect the uh, manifold, all right, is sole geometry. So I'm coming uh, to the end to describe uh, this. All right. 
find the same word here. Well, so many faults I was treated by uh, my student Junilda and Neri. All right, in this case, fundamental group is uh, Z cross Z, semi direct product with Z. And uh, this is the first case where the, uh, the, the number of manifolds having uh, uh, whose fundamental group have the same uh, family of finite quotients is not a one. It can be several, but it is fine, right? And uh, uh, what is the result? Uh, well, uh, this Z acting on Z cross Z by a matrix. I mean, generator of the uh, Z uh, is just two by two uh, integer matrix. And this two by two in, uh, integer matrix has eigenvalues. And uh, adding these eigenvalues to a field of rational numbers, we have a uh, quadratic uh, field. And then the result of Genio uh, Donneri, all right, is uh, that uh, the class number of this quadratic field is exactly the number of manifolds having uh, uh, the same finite quotients as a given manifold. Exactly the same. And then the question, uh, how do we describe uh, those uh, soul manifolds uh, as, 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 uh, that uh, are completely determined by uh, finite quotients of the fundamental group? And then we, we come to the conjecture of Gauss, uh, which is still open. Gauss made this conjecture in uh, 1801. He asked, uh, he conjectured there are infinitely many real quadratic fields with class number one. And this conjecture uh, really is still open. Right? And to describe manifolds with, uh, uh, that are determined by finite quotients of fundamental group is exactly to uh, describe a quadratic field with class uh, with class number one. So uh, if we have, uh, of course, if we have quadratic field, we can detect the class number. But here we have the opposite. Suppose we have a class number. How do we describe all quadratic field, right? With uh, uh, quadratic field with this class number. This is still open, and this is more general even than uh, conjecture of that. Now, uh, the case of six and seven, geometries of six and seven, was treated by Gary Wilkes, all right, uh, Gareth Wilkes. And uh, he treated soffit manifolds, right? And he most, more or less uh, resolved the problem. He proved that the number of uh, manifolds having uh, 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 profound, uh, the same profound completion of the fundamental group is finite and more or less clearly how to uh, uh, compute why, how they are different. All right. And uh, very recently, uh, actually, so recently, a week ago, all right, uh, I saw in the, uh, in the archive uh, the uh, paper of Yu Li, Liu, right? And he proved that a finite volume hyperbolic three manifold, all right, are determined by uh, finite quotients of its fundamental group up to finitely many of them. This is very exciting result. Why? Because combined with this theorem about GSJ decomposition, this theorem, theorem, uh, second theorem on this slide, right? One deduces, all right, that a finite volume three manifold, right, is determined by finite quotients of its fundamental group up to finitely many of them. Okay, that's it. I'm finished. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, it was really exciting. Um, let me remind the audience and the ones that are joining now that at the end of the workshop, we will have a Q&A session. So please prepare all your questions or comments for this session. You can send them through the chat or on the Q&A session by just unmuting yourself. I'm, I need to stop share, right? That's, that's right. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, this being said, 
I would like to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Daniel Labardini. And so um, let me say some words about Daniel Labardini. Uh, Daniel Labardini uh, did his PhD at the Northeastern University in Boston uh, from 2006 to 2010 under the supervision of Andrei Selevinsky. From 2011 to 2013, he worked as a postdoc under the supervision of Jan Schröer at the Mathematical Institute of the University of Bonn in Germany. Since 2013, he is a professor at the Institute of Mathematics of the National Univer Autonomous University of Mexico. And in 2018, the Marcos Moschinsky Foundation and uh, the Physics Institute of the National Autonomous University of Mexico awarded Labardini with the Moschinsky Share for Young Researchers. He has supervised one postdoc, two PhD theses, and three, ma three master's theses, and two undergraduate theses. His main research interests are representation theory and cluster algebras. And he's also interested in algebraic combinatorics, hyperbolic geometry, and Teichmüller theory. And so it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Daniel Labardini. Daniel, uh, the microphone is yours. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ferran. Uh, thank you for the invitation to, to speak in, uh, in this workshop. Um, so I will begin sharing my, uh, my slides. So I think you, you can see them now, right? Yeah, that's right. We can see them yeah. here. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I will, I will uh, report on uh, joint work with uh, Christoph Geis and Jan Schroer. Um, uh, I'm going to speak about the uh, laminations and surfaces and uh, Thurston's shear coordinates via varieties of representations of quivers. Um, so I'm going to be working uh, with the surfaces with marked points on the boundary. Um, so it's, it's uh, sigma is uh, just a surface, which I think just as a two-dimensional real manifold. Um, and M is a non-empty finite set, uh, not a non-empty non finite subset of the boundary, uh, having at least one marked point, having at least one point from each boundary component. Okay, so it's a surface with uh, marked points on the boundary. Um, and uh, a lamination, or maybe maybe more accurately, it would be an integral unbounded measured lamination uh, on such an object, uh, is a pair uh, consisting of a, uh, um, a, a tuple of curves uh, of which I uh, require to be uh, non-crossing, uh, non-self-crossing each of them, and also uh, pairwise non-crossing. So there are absolutely non, no, no crosses between uh, the curves uh, of, in the tuple. Um, and then uh, they are disjoint from M, from the set of marked points. Um, and then, and they are not homotopically trivial in Sigma M. Uh, and then uh, what this exactly means, I'm not going to, um, to, to go into detail. Uh, just that they are not uh, homotopically trivial, not homotopic to each other, um, and if yeah, for any no, for any curve which is not a closed curve, uh, I'm going to require that the endpoints um, be in on the boundary uh, of the surface, um, and then and then uh, there's a notion of homotopy between such curves. Um, which I'm not going to, to describe into detail, just, just that, that uh, in, uh, in, such, in any such homotopy, any, any uh, curve which is not closed and hence has uh, endpoints on the boundary is, is, is not allowed to, you know, during, the, during, the, during any homotopy, uh, any, en any endpoint is not allowed to leave the uh, boundary segment in which it lives. Um, but it is allowed to move that endpoint. But anyway, so I'm not going to, to go into uh, much detail. 
Um, and then the tuple, this tuple, this other tuple, this M, is a tuple of, um, of uh, positive integers, which I think of as multiplicities of the curves. So somehow, somehow if I want to draw one curve several times, instead of drawing it several times, I just draw it once, uh, and then I record its multiplicity uh, as a positive, uh, with, a, with a positive integer. Okay, so that's, that's uh, a, uh, a lamination. If you want to see an example here, here, it, here there's an example of, you know, the, 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 the underlying surface is an, is an annulus uh, with uh, two marked points on each boundary component. And here, these yellow curves uh, form one lamination. Um, okay, so, so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, an example. Um, and the point is that uh, with respect to any triangulation uh, of uh, sigma m, um, so m, I, I, I think of m as a prescribed set of vertices for triangulations of sigma. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so all the all the all the arcs in uh, in the in any triangulation uh, uh, connect points in m. Mm -hmm. So, with respect to any triangulation. Uh, any lamination uh, has a vector of shear coordinates, um, which, uh, which I call GT of L, uh, and whose entries are defined by a very simple rule. So for every arc uh, in, the, in the triangulation, uh, well, uh, since it's in a triangulation, um, it is a diagonal of a quadrilateral of the triangulation, right? So. Okay, so I look at the quadrilateral where 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 the arc sits. Um, okay, and then and then for for uh, for each for each curve in L, I look at all the times that it crosses that uh, quadrilateral, and so it, it it essentially crosses it in three different ways. So either either well sorry in two different ways. Either it comes in and out. Of the quadrilateral, but in opposite sides. Uh -huh. So it would this would this would be these two first situations, or it it comes in and out in non-opposite sides. So the, the sides are are adjacent to uh, um, to it, the, the sides of the quadrilateral by which it comes in and out are adjacent to uh, to each other, not opposite. Um, adjacent in the quadrilateral. Okay, and then in the first case. When uh, it comes in and out in opposite sides, then I, I, I look whether whether with the arc Z, a Z shape is formed, or an S shape is formed. In the former case, I uh, I say that 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 this contributes with a with a with a plus one to the k coordinate of the vector, and in this case I say I uh, I uh, say that. It contributes with a mi with a minus one with a negative one to the k coordinate, and then in the so in the other cases, regardless of whether it crosses or not uh, the arc k, uh, I I uh, I set it to not contribute anything, uh, and then I do this for each you know for each each time that that uh, that uh, that the curve or that any curve of L um, crosses. This quadrilateral, and I do it with multiplicities. So, as an example, here we are back to uh, to the to the first um, uh, lamination we we had, and then here you can see here I have also a triangulation uh, of the surface. I I do not think of the boundary segments as arcs in the in the triangulation. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so so and then and then let's say let's so then 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 we have this lamination, the the the, the one the one in yellow, uh, and here you can you can see for instance, uh, let's consider this this uh, uh, this arc K, so you you see you see here is the the quadrilateral, right, and then here you can see that uh, that the that the the shape is you know it's a it's a, an S, kind of a, okay, yeah, kind of sort of degenerately drawn S, but it's it's an S with respect to that quadrilateral. So so here this contributes 
well, with a minus one, but taken with multiplicity, so, so minus M1, and, the, and uh, with a minus one, but taken with multiplicity, so minus M2. So the, 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 the case entry in this case would be minus M1, minus M2. And similarly, uh, here, the, the, the shear coordinate with respect to this arc, so the, this, this entry of the, of, the, of the vector of shear coordinates would be M1 plus M2. Uh, here it would be only M2. Here it would be only negative M2. So I mean you you can you can kind of just apply 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 this rule taken with multiplicities for each of these arcs. So it's a vector. It's a vector, uh, an integer vector um, uh, indexed by the arcs in the triangulation. Uh, and then there's there's a, a theorem of of Thurston that says that if you fix the triangulation. Uh, then, then uh, uh, this assignment that that to each lamination uh, assigns uh, its its uh, its, uh, cor its vector of shear coordinates is actually a bijection from the set of all laminations uh, to z to the t. Okay, um, and so 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 I I want to 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 sketch the ingredients. Of uh, of a new proof of this theorem, uh, of this theorem that uh, um, that uh, guys Schroer and myself recently obtained. Uh, so let me let me switch and speak of something that that uh, that uh, a priori seems to be completely different. Um, so let me take a uh, a quiver that is a, a finite directed graph, um, and let me take. Uh, a two-sided ideal of the path algebra. So the path algebra is, as a vector space, uh, has a basis all the possible paths, oriented paths on Q, uh, also taking one path of length zero for each vertex of Q. Uh, and then the word admissible, well, it just it just means that that the quotient algebra, the quotient associative algebra, uh, uh, is finite dimensional. Right? If you ask me, okay, so what's the multiplication here? What's the product that makes it an associative algebra? Uh, well, it is induced by concatenation, concatenation of paths. If two paths can be concatenated, the product is the concatenation. If they can't, the product is zero. Um, okay, and then you, ex you extend bilinearly to obtain an associative product on, on, on first here and then here. Okay, and then um, each, each vector indexed each vector of non-negative uh, integers indexed by uh, by the vertex set gives rise to a a uh, an affine algebraic set, which is um, well, you know, I, uh, I I think of I think of d as a dimension vector, and then and then I I uh, I put here all the possible ways of repre of representing the quiver via uh, matrices via linear maps with that with with that dimension vector. So uh, all possible ways of assigning uh, a matrix uh, to each arrow um, of the corresponding size, uh, but also in such a way you know respecting i, so that one one can from from such data one can actually define uh, in a natural way a module. Over over the over the associative algebra A, okay. So this is uh, this is an an an, an affine algebraic set. As such, uh, it decomposes as a as a union of uh, irreducible components. Mm -hmm. So uh, I I I uh, keep track of those irreducible components. So this is this is the set of all irreducible components for that dimension vector. And then, uh, and then, of course, I can take all possible irreducible components for all possible uh, dimension vectors. Mm -hmm. And then here, from 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 such components, I'm going to distinguish certain class of irreducible components, which are going to be the I'm going to be referring to as generically tau reduced. So I don't have much time to uh, uh, to explain what this means. Uh, very roughly speaking, it means that um, you know there, on, on, on each component for each for each dimension vector d, 
uh, there is a, a, a general linear group acting here. Mm -hmm. uh, and each irreducible component is uh, invariant of, under the action of that general linear group. Uh, and, and so each irreducible component uh, is the disjoint union of orbits. And um, somehow, uh, uh, and then an irreducible component is generically reduced, very roughly speaking, if, uh, if the orbits have very big dimension. Um, and um, and uh, yeah, I, 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 uh, I don't want to say much more at the moment because uh, it would consume the rest of my time. Um, but somehow it means that that uh, that or that orbits are very big. Okay, now this is this is this this is just also so far all of this is just to say that I'm distinguishing certain class of uh, irreducible components. Um, okay, and now uh, on the other hand, if you give me a module, uh, I can construct a minimal projective presentation, right? Uh, the, so, and the projectives appearing in the minimal projective presentation can be decomposed as direct sum of in the composable projectives. Uh, it turns out that the in the composable projectives of this algebra uh, are, uh, are um, um, parameterized by the vertices of the of the quiver. Um, so, the, so yeah, okay. So there, they, they are, there is exactly one in the composable projective for each vertex of the quiver. So when I decompose a projective uh, module, it it looks precisely like such 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 direct sums indexed by the by the vertices of the quiver. Okay, and then I record I record the 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 minimal projective presentation. I record it by means of uh, of uh, the multiplicities of the projectives, and then define uh, uh, something that I'm going to call the projective G vector by saying, okay, um, the, in, the, the one in degree one uh, uh, with positive and the, one in the, and, the, and the ones in degree zero with negative. Um, and then it turns out that, uh, so you see now, now, now for, uh, um, uh, for an irreducible component, I can take the G vectors of the represent of the modules given by you see, as, as I said before, um, each of the you know each each of these matrices allows me to define a module over the algebra A, uh, and then so I, so I can so for for every element of the of any reducible component, I can form the G vector of that element, uh, and then it turns out that that uh, uh, that there's always a dense open subset. Of the component where uh, where where this G, this projective G vector takes a constant value, I, I call it the generic value, and then taking taking the generic value of irreducible components uh, of the projective G vector uh, gives a bijection between the set of uh, gen of generically tau reduced components and Z to the Z to the uh, Q to, to the set of Z to the set of vertices of the quiver. And then here I'm taking certain decorated version of, uh, of uh, the set of uh, uh, generically tau reduced components. I'm not going to explain this because I'm running out of time. Okay, and then finally, um, in the last section, I'm going to try to link these two things that I've talked about because I have two two bijections to Z to the something, right? So, okay, so the first thing, uh, if, you, if every triangulation of, uh, of the surface gives rise to an associative algebra in a rather simple way. Um, I take the vertices of, uh, uh, you know, I define a quiver by, by saying uh, it's who are the, its vertices and its arrows. So the vertices are the arcs, mm -hmm. the arrows are drawn, uh, uh, in a, uh, you know, using the orientation of sigma clockwisely within each triangle of the triangulation. So every time I, ha I have a triangle, I draw arrows in the clockwise sen in the clockwise direction, mm -hmm. and I define the ideal 
to be the idea, the two-sided idea generated by all the paths of length two that are contained in triangles. So, so, so this would be in the ideal, this path would be in the ideal, this path would be in, this path would be in the ideal. Okay. Um, so I have an associative algebra uh, a, 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 a associated to any triangulation. And also every lamination uh, gives rise to a module, uh, basically, basically by, uh, you know, by every time I cross the triangulation, putting a copy of the, of, of the complex numbers of the, of the vector space of dimension one. And every time I have a segment, placing the identity between the two corresponding copies. Uh, a modulo, modulo, maybe, you know, every, every, any, any lamination that, uh, that it, any curve that is not closed, I just rotate it slightly so that it connects marked points. Mm -hmm. So here are some examples, like for instance, here, I have my triangulation and my lamination. I, I rotate it slightly. Mm -hmm. And so the, the representation would be only this. Uh, another one, for instance, here, I have uh, this triangulation of the annulus with two marked points. Um, so the, the representation would be this one. Okay, and so, so I, have, I have a way of assigning uh, a representation of, a, of an associative algebra given any lamination and any triangulation. And, and the, the, the theorem is first that the, the representation, this representation be constructed in, uh, uh, simple, in simple terms, belongs to exactly one irreducible component of, for that algebra. It actually belongs to the interior, to the Sariski interior of that component. That component is actually generically tau reduced. So it's one of the distingu distinguished ones. Um, the assignment, the assignment uh, that to, 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 the, to, the, to the lamination uh, uh, associates uh, in the component uh, on which it lies is a bijection between the set of all laminations and the set of, of decorated uh, generically tau reduced components. Uh -huh. um, the, uh, so you see here, uh, this one belongs to exactly one component and actually the the value of its projective G vector is the generic value of the projective G vector here. And it coincides with uh, Thurston's shear coordinate of the lamination. Uh, so we obtain a, a diagram, a commutative diagram. And so you see uh, by the theorem of Flamondon, this one is a, bi is a bijection. Uh, we have a bijection by four here. Uh -huh. So we have uh, this bijection. So we have uh, a new proof of, uh, of, uh, of Thurston's theorem, at least for these surfaces where the max points lie on the boundary. And that's all I wanted to say here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, this, this is a really interesting talk. I'm pretty excited after hearing it. Uh, so let me let me remind the public that is now joining that uh, we will have a Q and A session at the end, so you can send your questions via chat or just unmute yourself when the Q and A session begins. So this being said, I would like to introduce the last speaker of today. Uh, his name is uh, Luis Núñez Betancourt. So um, let me say some word about, uh, about Luis. Luis Núñez Betancourt, uh, well, he's a mathematician at the Centro de Investigación en Matemática CIMAT in Guanajuato, Mexico. He obtained his doctoral degree from the University of Michigan in 2013 under the supervision of Mel Hoster and did a postdoc at the University of Virginia, mentored by Craig Kuneke. Uh, in 2020, uh, Luis received the Umalka Award for the from the Mathematical Union of uh, 
Latin America and the Caribbean, the Umalca, for his contributions to commutative algebra. And today, uh, Luis Nunez Betancourt will talk about uh, differential operators in commutative algebra. So welcome, Luis. The microphone is yours. Thank you, Ferran. And thanks, everybody, for, for being here. Uh, let me just share my desktop. OK, so it's, it's showing the full screen. Yes. Okay. Perfect. perfect. Well, first of all, I want to thank the organizer for well organizing this wonderful activity and for uh, inviting me to be part of this. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about uh, commutative algebra, but for that we are going to go to do something in in that sounds more like analysis of differential equations. And to me, this shows that you know all math is interconnected, and and that's kind of the point that, that I want to make today. Um, okay. So then me, so what I want to do is present uh, what differential operators are and try to relate it to some things that are more familiar to us. And then I want to show a few results, which only proof I know is using differential operators, even though the theorems, some of the theorems I'm going to mention do not have the word differential operator or anything like that. Uh, the key parts of the proofs uh, uh, use this, this tool. Okay, for that, uh, let me do oops, a setting. So um, for us, uh, K is always gonna be algebraically closed field. This is not necessary for everything, but uh, just for some points uh, or some statements I wanna do, um, they look a lot nicer if the field is algebraically closed. And we're gonna assume that R is a finally generated K algebra of dimension D. This just means that R is you take a polynomial ring and then take the quotient by any ideal. That's, that's a finally generated K algebra. And here, when I talk about dimension, what I mean is the cruel dimension of a ring, no? like the ascending chain of, of primes, prime ideas. Okay. So let's, let's define uh, first uh, a derivation. So a derivation is, is what we know from calculus one, is just a K linear map that goes from the ring to itself, such that satisfies the Leibniz rules. No? So the derivative of F times G is F times the derivative of G, plus g times the derivative of f. And this happens for, by every element in, in the ring. This is something that we're familiar with since we started studying mathematics. Let me make an observation. <clears throat> if I have an element in the ring, I can define a map that goes from the ring to ring, which is just multiplying by itself. So this map, I'm going to call it g hat. So g hat of r is just g times r. No? And in fact, all the maps that are R linear that goes from R to R are of this, this, this type, okay? So if I wanna take <clears throat> the commutator of a derivative uh, using with this map, G, G hat, and I wanna know oh, what, it, uh, what that is, no? So I wanna compute that explicitly. So if I take the commutator theta, theta of F, well, we have this formula with G of theta, and then, what we're going to obtain from the Leibniz rule that, that, you know, that we know that the derivative satisfies is that this is equal to F times once we evaluate the derivative in G and then multiply it by that. So the, the point I want to make with this observation is that when we take a commutator of a derivation with one of these maps given by elements in R, what we did is a map, a multiplication map by a different element in R. So taking commutators of derivatives give us multiplication by elements. And this is R linear now. So using this observation, we would like to define um, differential operators of higher order. <clears throat> and this was introduced by Grothendieck in 1967. So we define the set of differential operators of order smaller than or equal to N. Uh, by the following rule. So these are going to be elements that are K linear. So just linear transformations from R to R. And we want that the differential operators of order zero <clears throat> are these, are these maps that are just multiplication by elements in the ring. And as I described before, this is just isomorphic to the ring itself. Uh, what is more interesting is when we take the differential operators of order at most N, 
those are going to be all those k linear maps. Then when we take the commutator with an element here, which remember this is the home from R to R, so this is a, the g tilde that we discussed before. When we take the commutator, the order drop at least once. Okay, so what here is is this commutator uh, law operator that's going to play an important role. So an example of a linear operator of order one will be a derivation as, as, as we did before. So uh, an observation uh, is that well, you have a linear operator of order at most n minus one, it certainly has to be a, a differential operator of order at most n. And then something a bit more interesting is that when we multiply order at, in a sense, so this 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 behave well. So this this start uh, you know sounding like a, like a, we have some kind of filter filtration over there. And so what we're gonna do is define the ring of differential operators <clears throat> as the union of all these differential operators of, uh, order up to n. And from what we did before, of the observations that we did before, uh, well, this is there is a multiplication. This multiplication is just you know the multiplication in, in composition because all of these are linear transformations. Okay. And this is going to be a filtered ring, no? So it's a ring that comes with a filtration given by the order. So a few observation is that the we will. We already discussed, actually, we proved that the deriv derivatives are differential operators of order at most one. But you want to see which uh, ones are the differential operators of order at most one? Well, are just those plus the differential operators of order zero, no? which are the, the home from R to R. And one may expect that, well, that should be everything. No? When we expect, well, when do you just multiply derivatives and then, you know, let's say like a Differential operator of order two is like you, you multiply two derivatives, and that is not quite all. So this is this is why uh, this definition is a commutator, is because there are differential operators of order two that cannot be obtained from derivatives. So this is given some um, deeper meaning of what does it mean, what what, what it is a, a differential operator of higher order. So we can think of, of differential operators. Just like a, 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 an extension of, of derivatives by a higher order, which is not just multiplying. Okay, and um, for this reason, the ring of differential operators is not always generated by derivatives. So we have to have more things, and we're going to see some examples uh, soon. <clears throat> so if I if, if for field is characteristic zero, and a ring is polynomial ring in a bunch of variables, then Actually, this is the nice case. This is the case when the ring is actually generated by derivatives. And this is uh, what is called the Weyl algebra. So you take the ring. And uh, remember, we can think of elements in the ring as, uh, as linear transformations, you know, multiplying by that element as we date the correspondence g with g tilde. And then we just add the bunch of derivatives. So this is the nicest case. But if we change the characteristic, it's still a ring of polynomial, a polynomial ring in, in over a field, but we change the characteristic, then things get kind of messy. We need to get divided powers. So the derivatives are not enough to get everything we need. So we need to take the divided powers of derivatives, no? And here is the problem is that if you are in a field of characteristic two and you take a derivative of uh, let's say x squared, that is going to be give us zero. It would take uh, the second derivative, you know, like dx twice of x squared, that is going to give us zero. And that's kind of a problem because, in, in a way, we need a, a differential operator that sends x squared to one in a field of characteristic two. So that here is when we need to start taking divided powers. And then it's, it's a bit technical uh, um, how, how, how this operates and why these are all differential operators. Uh, but I don't want to get there. Um, um, I just, well, the point I want to make is derivatives is not enough, even in polynomial rings. Okay, but now that we have these two cases, we can build the differential powers for any question. So for a finally generated algebra, as we want to do it, uh, as, as it was our, our, our convention. 
sorry, or original setting. And in this case, what we do is, well, we take all the differential powers over the polynomial ring, which from the previous two examples, we understand what they are, that leave the ideal uh, invariant. So that means that when we go modulo R or sort of modulo J in R, uh, this sends zero to zero. So these are gonna define um, things that make sense over R. And then we're gonna take J time DS and that is somehow the trivial uh, operators. So this way we have a formula, but you know, this, this is telling us that in order to get the ring of differential operators in, in, in R, uh, we have to get, to get a subring in the differential operators of RS. And this is when things can get messy, really messy, uh, because we know that, for instance, that there exists subalgebras of finally generated algebras that are not notarian. So things can get uh, weird uh, for, for rings of differential operators. And uh, that do happen. Um, but um, so, so, so something's not really nice happens with these rings, but uh, a lot of nice things happen. So let me mention a few examples of problems that can be solved in commutative algebra using this um, um, ring, which is non-notarian many times, which is not commutative most of the times, but it's still very useful for, for, for commutative algebraists. So um, uh, the first uh, result, and I want to mention is, well, needs to, to observe that the ring is a left D model. Because, you know, the ring uh, of differential operators is just maps that goes from R to R. So it's going to be a model just by evaluation. Um, if we invert an element, so we take the ring that is generated by R and also the fraction of F, then it's also a left model. This is easy to see in the first example that because you know even from from calculus one we know how to take the the, the question rule for, for derivatives so so that's how the derivatives act in 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 the fraction one over f and then we can just extend to the whole ring because the derivatives are the guys that generate it in the other case is it's a little bit trickier but one can do it um can see that, that there is an action that is well defined uh, by using some sort of uh, induction over the order. And then once we have that, then we can do it for any finally generated key algebra. Okay. Um, so a theorem, a classic theorem is by Berson and Sato that says that uh, if the ring is a polynomial ring, then this localization model, so when we add the fraction one over F, then this is, Sorry, this if is not here. So this is finally generated as a DR model, as a D model. And this is very interesting now because when we localize, when we take a fraction, this model is not finally generated as an R model. That ring is too small for this model when we, once we add the fraction. But as a D model, because we somehow extended the ring by adding some kind of higher derivations, then our original model became small, the one was big. And, and, and this is um, very useful. Um, I want to mention that this theorem that I am attributing to Barson and Sato is not the way they stated, but this is a, a, an immediate corollary of, of, of the theorem that they had. Okay. You want to look in the literature, uh, it's, it's going to look a bit different. Okay, so a theorem by Hunek and Sharp uh, and Lubeznik um, is that if the ring is if in a polynomial ring, the local cohomology models have finite set of associate primes. And I know that haven't defined associate primes or local cohomology. The point that here that I want to make is that, or what I want to tell you is that local cohomology is something very important in commutative algebra. It's a cohomological theory. And these guys are usually not manageable because they are huge. They are not finally generated as an R models. And from the previous theorem of Reinstein, we can see that these guys are going to turn out to be as small as a, as a D models. And then working from there, one can get properties of them as an R models. So using the structures over the ring of differential operators, let us obtain finite results of an infinite model in, 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 in over the or original commutative ring. And that, that was uh, um, probably one of the first uh, applications of uh, differential operators in commutative algebra. So that big models do behave as a small modulus in, in, in different senses. Okay. Um, okay. So, okay. 
So now I want to mention uh, a different results uh, in using singularities, but for that I need to, to make some, some uh, definitions or recall a few properties of this. So we're going to say that a ring is smooth if when we localize at it, it's a regular ring. Um, um, this definition is not standard, and actually this is not the official definition, but in the context that we're working in, this is equivalent. Now, for those that do not know what a regular ring is, um, let me just put it in terms of, of geometry. So when we have a ring, we, the, we can see a, a geometric space, you know, like the spectrum of, of the ring, or we can think in like a bright variety, you know? so a bunch of zero, a series of a bunch of polynomials. So because this uh, uh, a final algebraic variety is containing Kn, we can think in what is the tangent space of whether it makes sense. So we're going to say that a point in, 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 um, in a variety is a smooth if the tangent space is well defined and this has to have dimension d, which is the dimension of, of the variety of the dimension of the ring. So we're going to say that m or b, depending with context geometric of algebraic you're working, is singular if it is not a smooth. And for this, let, let me mention a few things. To see if something is smooth or not, uh, there are criteria. So if we take, uh, we say that a polynomial is smooth if at least one of the derivatives does not, uh, does not vanish. So this is like what given us that is a, a, a Jacobian criterion to check whether something is smooth or not smooth or singular. And this will tell us whether the ring, uh, when, once we take the question by f, is smooth or not. And so let's see some examples, geometric examples. For instance, if we have the ring corresponding to these curves, the first one, the first one is going to be a smooth, and that kind of one can see it there. And and the tiny expanse is just going to be a line that is moving according to what you move the point. In the second um, image, in the second curve, we have two lines that are crossing. So in every point that is not the origin then we have a well-defined tangent space, no? The line itself where we're taking the point. But in the crossing point at zero, then there is something that is not clear, no? What should be the tangent space? Like the, the, the line with positive um, tangent or the line with negative slope. And we can check with the Jacobian criterion that we just discussed that when we take the derivatives of this point at the value at zero, all of them are gonna vanish. So this is gonna be singular. And we can see that that point at zero is, is special. Let's see two other examples. And here, you know, I mean, I'm not putting the equations, um, but um, for us from, from, from the rise, we can see that the first one looks smooth everywhere. And the second one has a, a distinctive point at the origin. Uh, I wanna mention that I took these images uh, from the gallery Imaginary and these images were done by uh, Herwin Hauser. Okay. so. Okay, so a smooth point, good, singular point, uh, bad but interesting. That's kind of the point I want to make. And we're going to try to study these kind of points using uh, differential powers, sorry, differential operators. And for that, we need differential powers. So, given an ideal in any finally generated K algebra, the n differential power is going to be defined by all those elements in the ring. Then, when we apply a differential operator of order at most n minus one, then this thing stays in the, in, the, in the ideal. Okay, so are those elements that when we apply differential powers, they stay there. And these uh, were inspired by the Sarisky Nagata uh, theorem of, on symbolic powers. And from this, we can get immediately a criterion to detect singularities. So we, we're going to have that a maximal ideal is going to be. A smooth and a smooth point of R, if and only if its differential power is exactly the ordinary power, no? the ideal generated by the n products of, of elements in, in M. So um, th th this was young work with Jeffries, sorry, with Brenner and Jeffries uh, last year. And then using this, we were able to give an invariant um, that we call the differential signature of R at a uh, at, uh, maximal ideal. And what we did is we take the length of these differential powers, which is going to be finite. We normalize by n to the d, and then um, take the d factorial. Now, this is very similar to uh, the hilbert samuel multiplicity, or what is called the degree in, in algebraic uh, geometry. 
And I'm not going to give a, a, a lot of research about differential signature, but I do want to mention that this number does detect and measure singularities. We have cases when you can uh, replace the limb sub by the limit. We have cases where it is a rational number. And we have a lot of properties regarding singularities now. And I can talk more about that uh, later in the Q&A if, if there is time or if there's people interested. Um, and then um, the final result I want to mention how um, uh, differential uh, operators relate to, to algebra geometry and commutative algebra is Nash blobs. So for that, let me give uh, the definition. So if we have an algebra variety, and I, right now I'm just going to think of fine, but we can do this in general. Um, if a point is not singular, then we already saw that the tangent space is going to have dimension D, the same as, as, as the variety, which is the same as the corresponding ring. So for every point, we can associate its uh, tangent space in the Grassmannian. So we're going to take a map that, that just do this, sends a point to the point comma its tangent space. And the Nash blob is just going to be the closure, the Sarisky closure of this image. So what we're doing is for every singular point, we're kind of replacing it by the limit of tangent spaces of the nice points surrounding, no? the singular, the smooth points surrounding that. Um, so in, in our previous case, here in the singular in the cross, that the point zero will be replaced by uh, uh, the space generated by the, the limit of one line and the other. Okay. So and a big question at, at the time um, was, can one obtain a smooth variety using Nash blobs? So what does it mean? Is that if you give me a, a, an algebraic variety, which is not smooth, then I apply Nash, and then I can ask, is that smooth? And the answer is no. Then, okay, apply Nash. I say that's smooth and then continue. And the question is, this process eventually gives me a smooth uh, variety. And for that to make sense, well, not to make sense, to, to be significant, a significant question, we need that the Nash blob does change the variety when it's not smooth, when there is a singularity. Because if I have something that is singular, I apply the Nash blob that gives me the same, then I'm going to get like an infinite loop. And that process is not going to help. So we need, in order for this to be significant, is to get uh, that, that theorem. And what are we interested in this? Is because, you know, smooth points, smooth varieties are the best. So somehow we would like to have a, have a singular variety, apply some process, and then we get a smooth variety that resembles the original in certain ways, but it's smooth. So we can uh, use all the theory that we know for the smooth varieties. And, and this is what's called a resolution of singularities, uh, roughly speaking. And, and this, that was the goal no, at, at the time. So for um, fields of characteristic zero, uh, Nobile uh, proved that if X is not smooth, then the Nash blob does change, does modify the variety. And, and then, so this question makes sense there. And since then, since 1975, there is a lot of work in Nash blob and characteristic zero. And I think this is one of the um, first uh, steps, no? like one of the foundational results in order for this theory to, to be studied there. And why it has been studied only in characteristic zero is because in prime characteristic, there is an example also by Nobile and even the cusp in, 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 but in characteristic two, then the Nash blob does not do anything. So we have a curve, which is very well known, very well studied. Uh, for this one, the Nash blob just gives nothing different. It doesn't modify it. So it will be a contraexample to the theorem that you would like to have in, in prime characteristic. Sorry, in, in, well, yeah, in prime characteristic. So uh, in a young work with uh, Daniel Duarte, this year, we say that, well, if your variety is, has prime characteristics, you may have to add something a little bit just a little bit more free variety to have the analogous of novel result, and that's with normality. So we prove that if uh, a variety is normal and not smooth, then the Nash blob does modify the variety. And I want to mention that norm normality is not a big hypothesis, or it's not a big ask from a variety. In fact, if you give me a, a, a variety X, I can take its normalization with some gain a variety, 
and this normalization represents well the original variety. So then, then having normal variety is not, is not a big deal. And actually, if we go to the, to the original question, this that is in, in red, then the question will be, give me the variety, take normalization, take Nash blob, then take the normalization, the text Nash blob. So I have to add a middle step, but then the, the questions still make sense. So the theory of Nash blob are, is still significant and interesting in, in, in prime characteristic. And this is one of those statements that do not have differential operators in, in, in the statement, but in the proof, we use differential operators, differential um, powers, and, and they play a, a crucial role uh, there. Uh, and with that, I, I, I finish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luis, for this, this wonderful talk. Um, wonderful, four really wonderful talks showing us the unity of mathematics. Um, so now I would like to uh, say to the public that uh, we will have a Q&A uh, session. So I invite you, I know some of you are shy, some of you are less shy, to send your questions through the chat for the speakers. We have a chat here in Zoom and I would like to uh, say to the other organizers, I cannot see the YouTube channel. We're transmitting via YouTube also live. If there are any questions in the YouTube channel, please uh, let me know because I cannot see it right now. So we will wait a little bit to see if any questions are coming. If not, I will uh, start the discussion because I have a questions of my own. <laughs> okay, and there are no questions in YouTube. And so since people are rather shy, I would like to start uh, addressing questions to each of the speakers, uh, beginning with uh, Professor Dickenstein. Um, I had a question re regarding uh, the last slide that you had, uh, where you said that there is, uh, well, there's still the, the general case that is open for the general version of the cuts rule. And you said that, uh, there is no conjecture, but my question is, um, is there any uh, experimental evidence that shows a direction uh, for a conjecture? Have you uh, done any uh, experimental uh, research to see what, what might be a conjecture or a possible conjecture under some hypothesis for uh, a general version of the Cartes rule? Oh, in fact, we know what things do not work in general, but we really, really need a new idea to have a conjecture. We need something different that, from the tools that we've been using up to now. We really don't know. Okay, this is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I have a second question. At some point, you mentioned part of the work uh, happening at uh, equivalent of over Bolfach for computer science. Uh, so th there is a link for coming, there is an inspiration coming from applications for all this. Can you comment more on this? Uh, yes, in fact, I landed into these math questions because I started being interested in applying algebra geometric tools to the study of biochemical reaction networks. In general, there is a standard modeling when there are enough molecules uh, and they are well distributed, then there, are, there is a standard um, modelization using a system of uh, ordinary uh, differential equations, where, which is of the form F x dot equals f of x, where the f's are polynomials. And they can, there is a directed graph of uh, reactions. And under the assumption of what is called mass action, then you get um, some, the, P, the f's are polynomials and they have a combinatorial structure that comes from the graph. Mm. And then we started looking at those uh, equations, which are, they, they are widely used to model uh, signaling pathways in the cell. 
And then one main question is whether you can get more than one, what's called a positive steady state and a certain conserving some quantities. And this question is a question about the number of positive roots of a sparse polynomial system. So, and it's a, it's a main question to decide whether your system in what is called multi-stationary or multi-stationary, monostationary or multi-stationary. This is one of the main questions to understand whether starting at different points of, of uh, coefficient space, you can land into different, different um, dynamic behaviors. So what to expect from your modeling if you don't observe it, but if you start to start it at maybe at, at an instance which it has not been observed, but which could be a different outcome mm. of the of the of the final behavior of the differential of the dynamics of these uh, differential equations. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this, for this ex explanation. Well, it's very obscure, but I cannot say more. No, no, it's, it's, uh, it sheds light to, to, yeah, what I was thinking. Uh, so I, I had a, some other questions for, for Professor Pavel Zaletsky. Um, well, there are two set of questions. The first one is, uh, I, I know uh, you work basically with, uh, fundamental groups of three manifolds that uh, are somehow finitely generated, but uh, is, is anything be being explored in the case of three manifolds uh, whose topology is not uh, finite in the sense I'm thinking of uh, complements of wild knots and this kind of things. Is there a way there to, to detect uh, some sort of uh, geometry looking at uh, the corresponding quotients of the fundamental group? Well. Uh, uh, there are three things. Uh, if we consider closed manifolds, then uh, that's exactly what I was talking about. But I didn't tell anything about if you have a manifolds with cusps. Right. But geometry, uh, geometry of manifolds with cusps also uh, can be detected, right? But I cannot tell any more further, yes. And a fundamental group in this case, by the way, in three manifolds, not only finitely generated, but finitely presented. It is very important. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, yeah. Okay, and, and my second question was about uh, the recent work of Ji Liu. Uh, what's the breakthrough? What's the what's what made uh, Liu possible to go for close manifold? I, I, I didn't manifold? I I didn't read it in details because it's very new. It's just a week ago appears, right? I didn't have time to okay. uh, to read it through in with the details. I, I, I read introduction, I looked at the theorems, right? But I it was so exciting that I decided just to report it to everybody because <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah, I just asking in case uh, yeah, you had read it. So I'm um, not seeing any more questions, but I also would like to invite the speakers if they have questions for each other to, uh, you can also ask to other speakers. That's not uh, forbidden. Um, let me just check again. No more questions. Uh, not here either. Uh, so, if not, I will have, I would like to make a, a question for Daniel uh, Labardini as well. Um, Daniel, um, so when, when, when one looks at the laminations in the work of Thurston, uh, there's also like an infinite uh, object that is the one that when you take uh, one of the curves or the system of curves that you were considering and you hit it with a, a homeomorphism of positive, and, entropy, let's say, you get some infinite object, like, uh, yeah, uh, that is not a, not a, not a curve anymore. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of the existence of these objects. So my question is, uh, is there an algebraic analog for, for these uh, limits of laminations in, in, of limits of curves in this sense? Uh, uh, you, 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 mean, you mean things like uh, that, 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 for instance, curves that spiral infinitely, like uh, are infinitely to a point or to a, or to a boundary? 
is, is that is that what you're saying or yes or for example just imagine like in the example of your of your annulus and or or of a torus with some puncture that you start hitting this with uh, some homeomorphism that has a hyperbolic derivative so your curves get more and more wrap around and they limit an object in at the limit, which is one of the objects that Thurston studied. Um, is, is there, I will guess no more an algebraic uh, version of this, but uh, what have you studied? What does correspond this in the algebraic setting? Uh, no, I would say I, I don't quite know what, what uh... Right. Yeah. I mean, at least not 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 in this setting. I mean, uh, like, uh, what what mo what module would correspond to it? Uh, or like, for instance, or I wouldn't know. No. Okay. I mean, I mean, I know that 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 uh, that uh, some people have a uh, like have um like as you know have studied like freezes as in as in Conway's freezes. Mm -hmm. That, and that they can kind of produce like uh, some infinite freezes uh, from from some like from such like limiting curves, but it's it's not quite. I mean, it's kind of it's it's not it's not so directly, re you know, related to defining just like a module over an algebra. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay. I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, there's something in the chat, maybe. Oh, yes. So we have a question from Victor Sahir. Um, he says, I'm reading the question. Good afternoon. My question is to Luis Nunez. Is there any relation between the Nash flow of and the normalization of a singular algebraic variety? Yeah. Um, okay. Thanks. Thanks, Victor, for the question. Um, um, apparently not. Th those are two different uh, processes. So that are not um, uh, like you cannot get one from the other, but they are related in the sense that um, a lot of times to get uh, good results, uh, uh, or to, and you need the variety to be normal, even in, in characteristic zero. For instance, there is a, a theorem by Marcus Pivakovsky uh, that says that um, you can resolve a, a, a surface uh, using Nash blob combined with normalizations. So the process that was mentioned, you take a variety, you normalize, then Nash blob, normalize Nash blob. If you do this, then you can get a resolution of singularities. So th there is not like a, you know, like a, a strong relation in the sense that you can obtain one over the other, but, but there is a, a day together uh, give you like nice things about about the resolution of singularities. Okay, thank you very much. Victor Sahar says thank you very much as well. And continuing with the questions for you, Luis, I had a question regarding uh, your your exposition, and my question is: um, you mentioned the differential signature. And you mentioned uh, Nash blow-ups. Is there a relation between uh, like a bound of how much Nash you have to do in terms of the differential signature of your singularity? Um, well, um, there, there's some relations. Um, uh, something that I, I didn't mention is um, there is something called higher Nash blow-ups. Mm -hmm. and, and when you... Uh, try to get some sort of uh, nobe, nobile like um, theorem then then they, they, that puts some restrictions on, on the differential signature and then one can get results that are not as nice as you know things have to be regular or different if they are singular uh, but they, they give you something re related to a strong of regularity which is uh, um, singularity typing in a tight closure and um, there is there is uh, some project that we're trying to, to understand how Nash blob modifies the the differential signature, and in order to 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 to, mm -hmm. to answer this question about whether you can get uh, 
nice blob, sort of the, the, the nicest um, differential signature, and then we can you know, obtain resolution singularities. But we we just starting and we don't have like any interesting result to, 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 to report yet. Okay, thank you very much uh, for, for the answer. I have no further questions for the speakers. I will wait just a moment more to see if there's someone else uh, uh, willing to make a, a question. Okay, it seems like uh, people are uh, rather shy today, but uh, uh, I would like to add, uh, take the opportunity then to make some close uh, closing statements. Uh, first, uh, um, I would like to say that the video of this uh, workshop will be in the YouTube channel that uh, I will ask other organizers to put the link in, uh, in the chat. And also, it's a YouTube channel of the Chong Academy of Argentina. Uh, so I really like this, this workshop because when we decided to organize it, we just decided the theme of algebra. But uh, at the end, I have this uh, feeling that the workshop has shown how the unity of math uh, is omnipresent. I really like how uh, the names of Thurston and Descartes and, uh, keep appearing and of Nash uh, keep appearing, relating all these uh, areas together. And um, I would like to finish by thanking, well, the, the organizers, Twas and Tian, and our sponsors, uh, the Brazilian Academy of Sciences and uh, the Jong Academy of Argentina. And also, I would like to take a moment to thank the people behind the screen that are the other organizers making this happening. In particular, Franco Cabrerizo, Hernan Greco, and last but not least, uh, Jacqueline Mesquita, which are the people that are making, putting all these things together. And so um, we will probably have some of other workshops next soon, and we will let you know. So I would like to thank also, last but not least, all the speakers for their wonderful work, for getting early and uh, doing all this. This is something that has allowed us to share and show the beauty of mathematics uh, through all the planet. And uh, thank you very much again from, uh, from all my heart. Thank it's you, you're, you're a wonderful host. Thank you, Alicia. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, thank so you. thank you very much. Um, Just a comment is that the video will appear in, in a few hours. It's not immediate. That's so right. Somehow YouTube has, has to process it. Yes, yes, the, the, it has to process it. And, but I will say, if you want to see it uh, in 24 hours, it will be there for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. With this being said, I will close formally this workshop and I hope to yeah. see you next time. Um, oh, sorry. All, only to say that we could take a picture of uh, all the speakers. Oh, like, yes. Uh, yes, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> this thing of waking up at so early makes me forget something. So please, the speakers, stay some minutes at the end. We would like to take just a picture for the for the record. All the others, thank you very much, and see you next time.